Technically, the topic is um, an empirical investigation of Becker's prejudice model of discrimination. So that's the actual title of the paper, and that organizes our thinking on this project. What is it? And so the paper re-examines a very famous theoretical paper by Gary Becker, which yields the, paper, the original Becker paper, yields a series of predictions that oddly have not been tested about the nature of discrimination with respect to wage gaps. And my co-author and I, John Gurian, attempt to test those predictions with readily available data. And so one part of our job is to advance the literature on discrimination. Becker's original discrimination paper is a seminal paper in modern labor economics for several reasons. First, he begins, he writes in the late 1950s, early 1960s about this phenomenon that is evident to everyone, that blacks in particular receive substantially lower wages than whites. And this economist wades into this thicket. He formalizes, the second major contribution, is that he formalizes something that had been talked about loosely. He distinguishes between the thing called prejudice and the thing called discrimination. In particular, prejudice, the way Becker models it, is the thing that inheres in a person. It's a sentiment, a feeling, an animus. And so someone might be a racist, say. That's just a feeling. A collection of people will be differentially prejudiced some more than others. And in particular, let's focus on a set of people called employers. He says that that set of persons interacting with members of the minority group, say blacks, they, that prejudice is translated into wage differences between black and white workers. Maybe it is translated. And observed wage differences between otherwise identical black and white workers is the thing called discrimination. The prediction, the main and most fascinating one, is that if you told me on, you just walked up to someone and told them on the street that there are two labor markets with different sets of employers, some range from less to more prejudiced, and average prejudice in the two labor markets is different. One might be led to conclude that discrimination will be worse, worse against blacks in the on average more prejudiced place. Becker makes the point that that's not exactly right. That's not exactly right. In fact, it's wrong. But the way to think about it is the following. He says, market pressures act so as to discourage interaction between blacks and the persons who dislike them for two reasons. On the black side, it's obvious that I would like least to interact with the person who dislikes me most. That's trivial. On the firm side, he says, one consequence of prejudice is that I regard a black worker as more expensive than he is. That's how he formalizes the notion of prejudice. The combination of those two things means that blacks, when interacting with white employers or customers or whomever, will interact first and mainly with the least prejudiced people in a market. Yes? So that means that you couldn't imagine a situation in which some whites in a market are in fact prejudiced. But there is no racial wage gap whatsoever. Why? Because blacks will have sorted to the least prejudiced people first. It is only when blacks have to sort with whites more prejudiced than the least prejudiced guy that we observe positive racial wage gaps. Becker's fascinating prediction is that it is the prejudice of relatively unprejudiced whites that ought to matter. If you line up prejudice among whites in a labor market, is it true, is it true, that the prejudice of what Becker calls and we following Becker call the marginal white is what determines racial wage gaps? Or is it the case that other features of the prejudice distribution, which ought not to matter, so the theory says, do not in fact matter? This is in many ways the least intuitive thing. Becker's model says that in a case where the group in question is a racial minority, 
an implication of his model, is that, say, the 95th percentile most prejudiced white person should not matter. Why is that? Well, here's why. Because blacks will never interact with that guy. You see? So what John and I do is to run a horse race, comparing prejudice at different points of the prejudice distribution to observe racial wage gaps. Having estimated our model, we can then ask some questions, some hypothetical questions, like, how much do blacks living in a given labor market suffer because the distribution of prejudice in that market differs from the prejudice in some other market? Yes? And so we end up comparing blacks living in labor markets where the marginal employer is at a 25th percentile of the overall white prejudice distribution to labor markets where the marginal employer is at the 75th percentile of that distribution. Yes? And we observe that blacks lose something like $115,000 in lifetime earnings by living in the more prejudiced place. Wage differences persist, and not merely wage differences, promotion differences, um, leadership opportunities in major firms and small firms, etc. Economists are not sure why those differences persist. Now, John and I stress in our paper that if one examines prejudice over the last half century, um, it has declined everywhere dramatically. In the face of this declining prejudice, is there a reason to suppose that prejudice continues to play a role? Our results suggest that it does. We don't believe it plays a majority role. At most, we explain about 25% of the variation in wages. 25% is not 1% either. Now, reestablishing the importance of prejudice in the particular form emphasized and predicted by Becker um, might lead future authors, and John and I among them, to explore other ways in which prejudice might interact with more conventional and popular ideas about the source of racial wage gaps. Becker's model predicts that prejudice among employers could potentially explain racial wage gaps. However, pushing that model forward in the long run, economists call it, both Gary and subsequent writers, Professor Becker and subsequent writers, suggested that the predictions of that model were unlikely to hold in long-run competitive environments. Given that bias, then, the notion that the very thing that the model predicts ought to be important might not survive long-run competition, it's natural that economists focus on other, thi other things. One of the other things on which they focus is something that I myself find very persuasive, the idea that there is statistical discrimination. The observed wage gaps across groups have mostly to do with an information extraction problem. What I mean by that is, I meet you and I'm attempting to learn your ability. I do not know it. I see signals of your ability, the school you went to, your grades, etc. And I meet different kinds of views. Say I meet black views and white views. And the logic of the statistical discrimination model is that um, the firm's ability to draw accurate conclusions about the other person's ability, the worker's ability, is lower in the case where the person's black. For various slightly complicated mathematical reasons, it can be shown that that inability translates into lower wages. That way of looking at the world has become the predominant view among economists around the world. Notice there's nothing there about the firm being racist or sexist or anything. It's just a ex signal extraction problem. But one could imagine that prejudice might interact with statistical discrimination, yes? And so when I observe a woman, say, because Becker's model could be applied to men and women too, who is incredibly talented, whereas the model might predict that it would cause me to nudge my estimate of women's abilities upwards, prejudice might cause me to disregard certain kinds of information. Yes? So the research in this area is interesting for furthering research on prejudice per se, and then prejudice interacted with other work. Given our major results, several future projects suggest themselves. I'll describe a couple. One has to do with this question. From where does prejudice come?
Right? Is prejudice the result of, I don't know, information or childhood interactions or something? And we'd like to understand that. Um, it's not exactly what we do in our research usually, but um, the question so bothers us that we're going to move in that direction. The second natural area is to say, look, prejudice might affect markets other than the labor market. One market where it might matter is, say, the voting market. What role does prejudice play in determining how people vote, how and whether they reward politicians for good conduct, the importance they attach to race in supporting one candidate or the other, et cetera? That's a natural area into which John and I plan to move. 